Welcome to this week's program of Ascend, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. And today our guests are Jim and Kathy Gott from Los Angeles, who will have a number of things to tell us, both about what the uh, autistic community is doing and is reacting to COVID in Southern California, as well as uh, what we're calling autism in the major leagues uh, from Jim. Meanwhile, Will, I can't quite see your t-shirt, but what, what do you got this week? Oh my, tell us about that. Well, for, for, for the Halloween show, I'm, I'm wearing my orange in, in Best Buddies inclusion shirt. I, I got this from Best Buddies before the pandemic took over. And I, I'm wearing it to, to support Best Buddies. Best Buddies is all about inclusion and, and supporting the disability community. Every, every, anyone with a disability or, or from the art can, can be a member. Excellent. Thank you, Will. And I know Best Buddies is a strong supporter of Ascend, and we do a great deal of activity with him. So thank you for bringing that up. Tell us about how you got involved in the autism field. Well, Jim, since you brought I did, into I the did. field, let's, um, let's, you start. <laughs> my first son, CJ, uh, who is 32 years old now, was not diagnosed and um, I got divorced and Kathy and I got together and CJ was three years old and he came to visit us for a summer and he had not been diagnosed yet. And Kathy uh, just was like, you know what, there's some issues here and let's go ahead and seek out the professionals. And we did. And that was kind of the beginning of it. And then Kathy and I, our first son, Danny, who's 27 years old now, is on the autism spectrum also. So being blessed with two uh, young men in our family with autism has uh, brought us to you guys and on this wonderful road in the community that we live in. Very, very, very inductive. Um, what are some of your current projects? Okay, well, let's see. Um, I'm, I, I definitely like to keep busy and I'm really passionate about the work that we do and um, early on, um, the first program that we started is called Education Spectrum and primarily teaching uh, social skills to children and adults on the spectrum and working with families. And uh, I found that to be uh, very healing for myself in going through uh, the early years and the process and learning all about it and making all kinds of adjustments that being around other families who were in going through what I was going through uh, was um, very helpful for me. So um, that program is still going strong and started in, um, uh, let's see, 1996. And I was gonna share too, the most recent program we're launching next month is a program based on the wonderful Netflix series, Love on the Spectrum. I don't know if, you guys have seen it, but we just, we really loved it and loved the idea of um, working specifically on skills related to relationships and dating and doing activities like speed dating. And uh, initially we'll do it all online, of course, to follow CDC guidelines and we'll see where it goes. But that, it's, it's just a, a place to work, you know, hands-on with families. So that's one. And then we have uh, Danny's farm, which is a petting farm. And uh, Danny's got a tremendous affinity for animals and always felt one of the nicest, uh, sensory friendly, uh, enjoyable places for him were, were petting farms as he grew up. So um, we now have a working petting farm here in Los Angeles and we employ adults with developmental differences um, it's a very inclusive. And then we have a lot of interns through the regional centers uh, paid internship program who come and learn skills who are interested in going into maybe veterinary tech or any kind of animal care. So that's a labor, another labor of love. These are all labors of love. And then I consult for a variety of uh, nonprofits, uh, mostly in the adult 
space in Los Angeles, sort of um, following the, the trajectory of our children's lives now being adults, this, the big need for programming and housing and employment and you know happiness and a full, full life. So I, I could just go on and on. I don't want to take up the whole. <laughs> How about with, uh, the village, the village. Yeah, that's this is that's the... really exciting. We're um, I serve on the board of directors of Cornerstone Housing, and we are developing an inclusive, independent apartment community in the heart of Los Angeles, just south of uh, Beverly Hills, in a beautiful area. Um, just a luxury, beautiful apartment building, and. Um, very customized, individualized supports for the residents, but you know it's uh, it's just it's just amazing that we're able to do this uh, right in the middle of the city, and that is because of the big uh, philanthropic outpouring in uh, Los Angeles. It's just been amazing. So that's a big one. <laughs> Huge. Kathy's very busy. <laughs> I'm really busy. I've, I've been um, consulting for um, our local regional center on um, doing a lot of trainings and coaching families through the transition to self-determination, which is, you know, it's really exciting. I, I, I like to focus on the progress we've made, even though I know we have a long way to go. But, you know, when I was a kid, uh, there was this, you know, little yellow bus, if even families who had children with developmental disabilities were even living in the home because it was standard then to have people institutionalized in some godforsaken place most of the time. And, um, you know, there, there was no inclusion in schools. A little bus would come in the morning and then take them some, we didn't know, we had no interaction. We'd sometimes maybe see someone and that looked different, but um, so that, you know, just coming from segregation to inclusion, I think we've made tremendous strides. Now, what I see happening, which I love the most, is valuing each human being uh, for every human being has just as much value as the next, whether you have uh, any neurodiversity, anything, it doesn't matter. It's just we're all human beings and we all share our planet we share our communities and let's you know build those bridges and reach out to each other and really truly beyond just including but embracing and accepting and learning and that's that's really exciting it's an exciting time Kathy, I understand that you were a member of the uh, Los Angeles County Commission on uh, Disability. Can you t t tell our viewers a bit about that and what the work that you do there involves? Well, the best part is that my dad calls me the commish, so. <laughs> you don't look like Michael Chiklis, though. <laughs> You're a little bit better looking than he is. Okay, okay. Well, that is, that is, and uh, sometimes I ask Jim to address me as Commissioner Gott, and uh, it, that is the best part. So, no, it's, uh, you know, it's, a really a privilege to serve on that commission. We, the, my favorite part of these public meetings is hearing from the public and it has opened my eyes and my heart because I've been so focused on developmental disabilities and not just disabilities beyond more wheelchair access. And I, I just, it is, um, it is our responsibility to make life accessible and as I said earlier and embracing people's differences and uh, the more I learn the more I want to help and it's it's really a, a, a gift in particular on the commission there is a committee that I co-chair and that specifically addresses developmental disabilities and the exciting part is we have partnered with various departments um, mostly we're working with a lot of housing and making sure we're working on getting dedicated dollars to our population because we're lumped in with veterans and homeless and seniors and 
we have our own set of unique needs. So that's been really exciting to educate and collaborate with other county departments and also on uh, the work the workplace and really getting a commitment to embrace and learn about and how to support those with neurodiverse brains and the incredible gifts that they bring in our work workplaces. So um, we've had some, we really had some great initiatives started in those two areas. So it's been wonderful. Thank you. Well, well excellent. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Along those lines, what have been the biggest challenges that you faced uh, as the commissioner there? That everything is too slow for me. <laughs> mm. I am, uh, I like to, I'm not a list maker. Like if there's a to do, I just do it. Like, let's go, you know, I'll be on the phone with someone and I'll say, can you connect, hold on. And I start the email right then and there, like, let's go, let's do this. So uh, it does take time and I'm learning to be a little more patient just a mm -hmm. little bit because I want everything to change now so I think that's been that's been the hardest part well excellent last thing along those lines um, any upcoming uh, developments or accomplishments that you're particularly uh, proud of that you'd like to tell our viewers well that's really nice um, I will I was saying earlier <laughs> that <laughs> I uh, I promised I wouldn't get on any more volunteer boards, but I joined one recently. It's a fairly new organization called the Spectrum Works in Los Angeles. And this, these, um, the people who founded this organization came out of the corporate world and have connections to some pretty incredible corporations who trust them and know them. So they're attacking the need for jobs from the corporate side to in identify what they need and then bring the talent in that way. And um, they're working with a number of corporations. And at some point, I hope we can um, put their website up on your site and uh, you know share that because there's a lot of, I think a lot of uh, um, opportunity for collaboration with the great work you're doing up there. Well, excellent. That sounds exactly the kind of stuff that we'd love to be a part of and to support. So thank you very much, Kathy. Earlier, you talked about the value of inclusion, which is good. But there's a fine line, in my opinion, between being included and being ignored. And there needs to be some kind of middle ground between the two. I was fully included when I was in school, which may have been a good thing. I was also fully ignored, which is definitely not a, a good thing. I would have been better off if I had been acknowledged and gotten some kind of services to help me meet my needs. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on this? What, in your opinion, is the ideal balance between inclusion including as much as possible and ignoring the needs of the child. Well, I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up. And um, so thank you for asking that. You know, there really is no one size fits all. And I tend to be, I'm not, um, uh, I'm a very moderate kind of thinker. I can see things from both sides. I'm not really extreme on anything. I know that some people are like, you must be included, you know, it has to be this model or, you know, there's all kinds of views out there. Um, however, I'll give you an example. Um, our son Danny was fully included uh, in elementary school. And I will say for the most part, because he had a one-on-one -on -one aide with him helping facilitate that it was pretty successful in that a lot of the children were nice to Danny. Now, were they friends? No, they were nice. There were a hand, especially a handful who, who were really lovely. But when Danny got into middle school and the bullying started and um, just a number of issues um, that it was really impeding his ability to learn and we uh, ended up sending him to the help group, which is a non-public school. And I will say that because Danny was at a school with his peers, 
he truly has, these are his friends. This is his circle. This is with whom he can hang out and relate and game, play games with and whatever they do together. That is his, the neurotypical kids that are his peers, they're kind and try to include him when he can, but his, he didn't really form these friendships until he was in a place with like-minded people. So I don't know if I'm answering your question and I'm not sure why you were ignored. I, I like to learn more about that um, because you do have a voice and I know that that is really changing in, in terms of how people are served in uh, across the world really with a more a person-centered approach rather than somebody telling you these are the services that you need. Like that, that paradigm is really shifting. Um, so I don't know if you're talking about um, peers that were ignoring you or teachers or maybe if you could be a little bit more specific, maybe I can be more helpful. Well, and now even having uh, sensory friendly spaces at a lot of ballparks um, and uh, quiet rooms and um, earplugs and headphones available and uh, trainings at the Phillies. They even had a like a, a front office and all the uh, crew that works at the games to understand if someone's having a meltdown, you know, what do you do? And so there, there are so many steps that are, have been taken uh, that weren't there just a short while ago. So I know we, we have a ways to go, but um, you know, I'll, you, you have to tell that story about CJ at the, when we lost him at the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys are gonna love this. So CJ is three. We're having family day at the ballpark. So everybody can't wait, you know, you're, you hear of the Boone family and the Van Slyke family and so many families that have had generations play in the big leagues, you know, grandfathers and their father, and then the sons are doing the same thing. And so that's what I expected. So we're out there with uh, four of my kids and we brought grandma in with us. We brought some, a cousin to come and help us. And this is before our game starts, before the fans come in, our kids are all dressed in our uniforms. So CJ is wearing his uh, Jim Gott Dodger uniform with God on the back and my number. And we walk in and we check in in the ballpark. And right when we check in, there's, you know, the wonderful things and people there to support everybody. And one thing that was great, there was, there was a beautiful cake that was there welcoming the Dodger families. So that's underneath the stadium in the locker room. We all wander out there. We're out there. They're introducing the families. We're playing. We're doing everything. All of a sudden, one moment, the fans have come in the stadium now. One moment, we look and CJ's gone. We have 12, you know, so many eyes on him and he's gone. We have no idea where he is. I immediately go to the security because the fans are in the stadium already. I let them know that we've lost my son. He's got my number on his back, the whole thing. We start looking everywhere. I mean, we take 10 frantic minutes wandering the stadium, the field, asking everybody where CJ. All of a sudden, on my mind, I realize CJ might have gone back for something into the uh, underneath the stadium into the locker room. So I go wandering back there just by myself. And as I come up upon the opening of the locker room, the cake that was there that said, welcome Dodger families had a huge hand mark already <laughs> in it and it was gone. And I went, okay, well, I'm getting closer to CJ now. And I walked into the locker room and in my locker, CJ couldn't have been happier. He was sitting there just cake. eating the cake, cake <laughs> all over himself. So I, I, I loved him up and helped him clean up. And we went back out and let everybody realize that CJ was safe. But, uh, that was his experience at the ballpark. And one thing really quickly was that I expected CJ's experience at the ballpark to be like any other typical person. And what I realized was that the, the ballpark was way too loud. There were too many smells. The garlic fries just, in, just it was all over you. And the lights were so bright. There was so much unpredictability at the ballpark that that was not, CJ did not like to go to the ballpark because that was what experience I was giving to him. And once we realized it and got taught by wonderful professionals, CJ and I had the greatest time at the ballpark because we went there when nobody was there. 
We got there hours before the game when they were watering the field and CJ's best friends were all the grounds crew guys. They couldn't wait to spray him with some water or, or have him help them rake the ball, rake the field. And so uh, I'm so grateful for both of my boys on the spectrum because they've taught me how to really appreciate and love life. Based on what you know, based on you know who you talk to, known through the years, work within the years, are there currently any uh, MLB players that you would guess or that you know are on the spectrum? And so we're talking about a spectrum, correct? So in that spectrum, there is who knows what both ends are. And I am a very hyperactive ADD on medication, young man, <laughs> older man with all the gray hair. Um, but I am surrounded by guys that are incredibly gifted and they found their niche. They might have struggled in school, but these guys with OCD, with ADD, with ADHD have found a place to thrive. And I know that I think that I really believe that that's one end of the spectrum. And so I, yes. And one thing that's really cool, we had a kid that uh, we grew up, that my son Nicholas grew up with over in, uh, in San Marino that signed an autistic boy that signed a contract to play with the Kansas City Royals. Mm -hmm. And he's in the minor leagues with them. Tarek, right? Tarek, yep. So. Great to hear, Jim. Thank you for that. How, how how is the baseball community been adapting to the pandemic? It's been really tough. Well, we had a really tough season. I was with the uh, Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, we were in a bubble for most of the year. Uh, we would, when we traveled, we would go straight to the hotel. Uh, we would be on a plane. We would have masks on and everything sanitized. We'd go straight to the hotel in our bus. We would just... Uh, communicate and hang out with just everybody on the team. Whereas normally when you go to these cities, you go to New York and you can't wait to go down Broadway, 42nd street and go to eat someplace and do all of these things. And now what we did this year was we were just going back to the hotel and getting Grubhub or getting room service and then going to the ballpark. But the, to answer your question, the biggest difference was no fans in the ballpark and they were piping in noise of the fans, which I don't know why they did that, but it was kind of annoying, but I think they kind of drowned it out the play players in different parts of the stadium screaming and yelling at the umpires because normally <laughs> you can't hear that and now with the sound really down we had to be very careful with us disputing anything that was happening on the field sounds great um are are you gonna uh, are are you gonna re revive autism awareness day once the pandemic is over Absolutely. I think that's been really wonderful. And as Kathy was talking about, just the, the measures that are happening around the world, not just in the stadiums, but specifically in the stadiums of making everybody aware of where, how we can assist families to be able to bring a child that might have some struggles at the ballpark and let them still become fans. We want people to come out. There's nothing greater than for me to be with my boys and my daughter also, and my family, loving baseball, and all of them can be included. And we know little things that we can help each other. I have things that I have struggled with too. And I don't like the loud noise sometimes. I like to get away from the garlic fries because I want to eat all of them. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I can do, but um, baseball is doing a wonderful job. I think that when we start talking about what the future holds, I think what future holds is you three beautiful young adults right there and, and sharing your voice, even though it might be scary sometimes to be able to stand up and you might not be heard right away, put your foot down and keep on letting everybody understand what you're experiencing so that we can help. Excellent, thank you very much, Jim. So I think our final one, our final question is, Kathy and Jim, you've been involved for a very long time, both personally with your family members and organizationally. Where do you think things are going forward? What do you see as the, the near-term future of the uh, AS community? Well, what I find really interesting, and um, I don't know if the world is prepared for this, but this is where we're going. It's a, just a fact and a reality. We're looking at today the, in uh, you know, 2020, 2021 approaching, and the 
number of individuals entering adulthood, right? And there's this massive shortage of jobs and housing and opportunities and all kinds of programming. So, and, and we're already having such a shortage. And so when you look at that, so the adults of today that are emerging into adulthood and exiting either college or high school or a vocational program, those are the kids that were diagnosed in the 90s when our kids were diagnosed. So back then, right, in the 90s and like moving through the 80s and 90s, it was considered a rare developmental disability, right? It was, you know, one in 25,000, then it was one in 10,000. And in the, in the 90s, I think the highest incidence was, you know, maybe one in 5,000. So hello, look at today, one in 54, one in 54 children. Now, now that's today, but if you look at the numbers every year, right, it's going like this. So where are we going to be in five years? and then 10 years. I mean, just look at the kids today. So here's my point. You know, I don't get really uh, too vested in why this is happening. That's not really relevant to me. Uh, I, if somebody uses the word cure, I couldn't be more turned off because I don't think that it, I think it's uh, just a character trait, uh, just like having blue eyes or brown hair or, you know, I have sensory issues or I, you know, whatever it is, like it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not important. The important thing to realize is that our world, not just in our community, but our world is becoming more neurodiverse. That is the reality of what's happening. It's the way that human beings are evolving, whether it's environmental or genetic or a combination, you know, who, who cares? It's just, it's here. So the lesson for all of us is to embrace our differences, build bridges, educate people, and, you know, just be kind and compassionate and ask important questions. And, you know, everybody needs to live and coexist. And, you know, that we're, you can't separate people anymore. Everybody has rights. And that's evolving in a beautiful way. And I, I do think just the sheer numbers, that's, that's demanding change and the way that we value human beings and blend and live together. Uh, so I, I feel hopeful, so I really do. But I, it just, we have to do the work and we're doing it. And so, and like Jim was saying, your generation you know, I want to pass that to you so that you have your voices are so important, not just for the autism community, but more importantly for the whole community so that they can. I mean, just hearing you say, you know, I'm I was ignored. And, you know, that is just that's there's so many kind people out there. I just believe in the power of kindness and that most people want to help they just don't know how and they they don't realize sometimes what it feels like from your perspective and just the littlest changes can really really uh help our world just be better so it's, it's just an honor to meet you guys and be asked to be in the same space together this is so so nice thank you you are so welcome, and that was a wonderful message to hear. So thank you very, very much for being on our show. And just keep fighting the good fight. It's just so good to hear that somebody like you two are out there advocating for our community. It's so encouraging and so empowering. Once again, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.